<clears throat> okay, so um, now the second part uh, of the lecture is about the deep dive into the blind side. So compared to the normal uh, people's uh, non-conscious processing, blind side is quite puzzling. And uh, that's uh, even more a stronger reason to doubt the patient's report potentially, okay? Uh, before dismissing the blind side behavior, uh, which is actually very important uh, step towards uh, consciousness research, uh, we first need to uh, review uh, stronger evidence of blind side. And, uh, uh, in particular, we are going to look at the primate model of blind sight. And the uh, reason is the following. Uh, first of all, um, as I mentioned in the brain lesion uh, study overall, um, when this uh, type of the lesion, brain lesion happens is not super clear, as well as uh, when it happens due to the stroke or uh, trauma, like you know, a pole going through this you know, brain, um, it's very uncontrolled and which type of the neurons are damaged and which part, uh, particular part of the brain is lesion is very difficult to uh, uh, constrain. And also uh, distant effect of the neural damage is also uh, uh, impossible to uh, exclude. And therefore uh, it's very important to do the uh, monkey study and then constrain the uh, brain lesions uh, in space manner. And uh, just aside, uh, for example, in the case of the humans, uh, there are lots of cases uh, reported on the prosopagnosia, which is the blindness of the face. Um, we, we will be talking about it in a couple of weeks. And initially they were uh, uh, proposed as a damage to the particular area of the brain as a strong cause of this prosopagnosia. But uh, later studies also implicated that uh, uh, prosopagnosia may be the, um, uh, this, uh, the lesion, uh, the, the phenomena caused by the disconnection between the face area to other areas. And things like that is not possible to preclude in uh, just observing this uh, brain lesion patient. So we need uh, uh, this type of brain, uh, uh, controlled brain lesion study for a uh, primate, uh, uh, primate model to understand how human, you know, uh, system works as well as uh, to uh, um, provide a better treatment and also uh, a clinical care for uh, visual deficits in the, in the end for the humans, okay. And also the temporal resolution wise, uh, when this kind of thing happened, it's uh, very difficult to uh, estimate in humans. Uh, most of the blind side uh, patients were damaged in uh, really early in their life and then get tested after very, very late in their life. And partly uh, because, you know, as the case of the cerebellum uh, patients, many people are more or less, you know, uh, functional in the, you know, everyday life. So they don't need to go to the hospital uh, in many cases. So uh, even though, you know, um, you are, for example, blinded on the right side of the field, you can still use the left side of the visual field to, uh, you know, control your behavior. And so, uh, you know, after the initial um, hospitalization, they tend to be studied only late in the life. Okay, uh, and also uh, another important thing is that the primate, uh, because we don't have, a, you know, at least we don't know whether they have a social incentive to, you know, tell a lie and then become famous and then get paid and so on to be a famous patient. So, you know, that's uh, another important issue to think. You know, the motivation to lie is less likely to be there in the primate. And also uh, further experimentation of, you know, more controlled uh, manipulation of the brain lesions or recording from uh, many different areas of the brain is possible only under the um, primate uh, situation to understand the neural mechanism of the blind side. Of course, the disadvantage is that uh, we don't have a, a verbal communication to our uh, uh, monkey. So we need to have a very careful and clever experimental paradigm, but that's uh, possible. And then the training is also necessary for the uh, monkeys to understand the task. And that may itself change the uh, uh, connection of the neurons. And then uh, we might induce the blind side like behavior because of the training, which is something that we will be discussing in two, three weeks uh, at a time. Okay. So uh, let's uh, go back to the video of the Helen. 
And this video was uh, taken by uh, uh, Nick Humphrey, one of the uh, most important people who are who studied the uh, blind sight in monkey. And uh, this is an extended version of this uh, uh, Helen's behavior. Here, initially, Helen was uh, proposed, uh, you know, shown two stimulus, and then uh, if it's not moving, uh, she doesn't uh, notice it, but when it's moved like this, then now uh, she can actually uh, touch it. Okay, so that's a one first part. And then this is another part that uh, uh, I showed you in this short uh, clip where she explored the room without bumping into the object. And then uh, uh, here uh, she touched, but you know, uh, she couldn't actually uh, move, uh, uh, the, the, you know, interact with them in a meaningful manner. And uh, you know, no matter what they do, it's uh, uh, possible to do. And then one thing you might have noticed as a sort of potential uh, explanation of why Helen can now uh, do this type of the exploration is possibly through the echolocation. You know, uh, uh, there is an evidence in humans uh, that uh, uh, sound cue or uh, a feeling of the uh, yeah the sound. Uh, you know, coming back from the room or object is uh, used as a sort of the uh, cue to uh, avoid the object. And here, you know, because it's a mat, so it's very difficult to imagine something like that. But, uh, you know, uh, that's one possible uh, solution. And uh, Nick Humphrey played always a white noise outside uh, uh, behind this kind of experimentation. So that uh, type of uh, auditory uh, cueing is uh, unlikely to be um, the reason. And then now I'm going to skip the video a bit. And then to further uh, evidence that, you know, she is not using the auditory EQ. This is an important part of the video. Okay. So there are three glass plates uh, here and then here and then here. It's invisible, but, you know, acryl, you know, plate is there. So it's invisible for even us because it's transparent. And uh, if the Helen is using the sound as a cue to avoid object, uh, she should be able to avoid this, but let's see what happens. Okay, so as you saw, she bumped into this, you know, glass. Okay, that means that you know, at least in this particular video footage, um, suggests that you know she is not using the sound localization to avoid the object, but rather using this visual cue, and then find that you know oh there is something so uh, she needs to avoid. And uh, you know every time this uh, experiment is done, you know the location of the object is moved around, so she can't also use this in the memory to uh, guide her behavior, okay? Now back to the lecture, all right. So um, as I said, you know, white noise in the background that, you know, they are disabled uh, echolocation and also, uh, uh, you know, the invisible uh, transparent or low contrast stimulus is not visible to her. So before going further to the blind side behaviors, I, I want to uh, go into the, a little bit to the brain uh, neuroscience. So this is a comparison of the size of the brain in human, monkey, and mouse. And in human, um, roughly speaking, the extent of the human brain is roughly like 15 centimeter from front to back, and then uh, 10 to uh, 12 centimeter. Uh, from top to the bottom. That's a co uh, cortex, brain cortex, okay? And that contains uh, roughly 20 billion neurons or um, 10 to the 11 neurons in it, as I said before. Okay, and um, so the monkey brain is uh, roughly like five centimeter from uh, front to uh, back and then three centimeter from top to the bottom, roughly one third of, human um, brain, so um, the number of the neurons are also um, roughly 10 times uh, fewer. And this is the cerebellum part, and the uh, visual cortex is roughly this amount, and the prefrontal cortex, and somatomotor uh, cortex and parietal cortex is around here. Okay, so 
um, compared to human, um, the visual part of the brain is uh, bigger in a sense. And uh, uh, also important thing to notice is that uh, um, in the uh, primary visual cortex, which is the uh, location uh, critical for blind sight, is uh, also uh, slightly looks a bit different. Here is the lateral view. This is a lateral view. This is the lateral view of the brain. So looking my head from this side and then uh, on the surface. And then uh, it's really the back tip of the brain here. That's um, just the primary visual cortex. And most of the main part of the visual cortex actually goes inside into the brain and called the calcarine sulcus that we are going to talk next week. And then this along this calcarine sulcus and the fovea is around here. And then periphery is here that we are going to discuss uh, today towards the end, what uh, next week. On the other hand, the macaque uh, is uh, on the lateral view. There is a fovea already here. And then the periphery is uh, going towards there and then in the medial band. So that's a bit, you know, uh, reversed compared to the human. This is a medial view or sagittal view of the brain. And it's a bit different. The fovea uh, uh, periphery is reversed. Okay. All right. So then um, just to uh, uh, remind you about this uh, terminology, three ways, which is important to understand, you know, how uh, we navigate in this brain space. Uh, coronal or frontal space, uh, slice is cutting of the brain in this way. Okay. Sagittal and medial is uh, cutting the brain in this way. And then horizontal is this way, okay, uh, parallel to the ground. And here's the uh, uh, Koe and the Storics, uh, blind sand monkeys in a more detail. This is a uh, first of uh, their um, significant paper in 95 in Nature. And there uh, they studied four monkeys. Uh, one of them is a control uh, monkey, which was studied further on in, uh, and published in 2002, the one that uh, we, um, I introduced last week. But here, this in 95 uh, paper, they uh, uh, compared the three already blind side of the monkey versus control. And in this blind side operation, what they do is, uh, so this is an uh, important figure to uh, understand what they do. So they cut the primary visual cortex, which is around here, okay, by lobectomy. And then, uh, this one is this section around here, and this is a coronal section, okay? And then, um, so they literally cut the left side of the brain. And uh, by the way, I actually made a mistake here, so I'll change it, but the left and the right is reversed. And the left side of the brain here uh, is looking like a hole here. That's because uh, the they, this you know slice is made at this number two. Okay, so at the tip here, the visual cortex is removed, and that appears on this you know black hole. And then this is a uh, brainstem and cerebellum, and this is an intact right hemisphere. Okay, um, so they cut the left hemisphere of this monkey. Uh, visual, uh, visual cortex uh, quite a bit. And here's the uh, schematic for the uh, 2002 version. So just to give you an, again idea, the back of the head is sliced like this up until, you know, uh, four uh, foremost you know, slice of the visual cortex. And if you arrange uh, this slice uh, 1.25 millimeter apart, it looks like this, you know, uh, arrangement. And uh, you can see the cortical folding at each slice. And all these, you know, blackish, you know, um, uh, part is the so-called layer four neurons uh, um, uh, staining. And these uh, 
areas uh, that looks slightly darker compared to other areas uh, because I, I made it transparent. It's a bit difficult to see. But the uh, uh, V1 area is uh, very distinct in terms of the density of these neurons. And uh, uh, when you do this uh, anatomical staining, it looks darker. Maybe you can see it clearly here. So here it's very dark, but from here it, it's less dark. Here it's really dark and then it becomes less dark. And then here darker and again. So this darkness of these uh, cells or band of the cells are used as a marker for the boundary of the V1. And um, that's the one of the reasons why, that, that's the reason why V1 is called a striate cortex, uh, which we'll go in next week. So uh, this uh, 2002 paper, not only uh, compared the four um, uh, human patients, but also uh, Rosie, who uh, participated as a control experiment, which was a, ex a control subject in the 95 paper, and subsequently in this paper acted as a blind sight monkey. So Rosie's control uh, before lesion X uh, performance was reported already before. Okay, so the Rosie basically did exactly the same experiment as the other human blind side patients. Uh, trained on this task before the lesion was done and then after the recovery from the lesion, uh, six months later, they were tested like this. Here, uh, the format of the presentation is slightly different from the human uh, counterpart. So in the case of the Rosie, uh, she, compare, uh, she was tested with a normal hemisphere, the, left side and the right side separately. And because, you know, we couldn't ask her to do the verbal report for whether they saw, whether she saw it or not. Uh, this is both localization performance. Okay, so this is the localization. Accuracy and the 50% is the chance performance. And as you see that when the contrast is 5% or anything above, then the performance of this localization is always 100% accurate. On the other hand, the blind hemifield, she was very good at the highest contrast, like here. Uh, the localization of the things is almost like perfect, and it degrades, and, but still it's all above chance up to 30%, and then it becomes finally you know, chance performance at 20%. And so what they did was this uh, follow-up experiment using this signal detection task, uh, three alternative allowed. So HK is another blind side patient who is absolutely a blind side. So in his case, unlike GFI, uh, even when 99% very strong contrast uh, stimulus was presented in the blind field, he was able to do this localization, but could not say, did not say that I saw it. So the catch trial uh, like response here. So in none of this, you know, 99% trial, he said that I saw something. So response of, you know, third bottom that I didn't see anything is uh, what he reported. And here is the uh, normal control field uh, performance at 3%. And uh, he said roughly like 40%, 30%, uh, yes. And also this, uh, five or 20 or 35 or 20 is the, you know, the change of the proportion of the stimuli I explained last week. But in any case, you know, upshot is that the HK, regardless of the frequency of the stimulus, he just doesn't say, I saw it for 99%. And the ROSI was very similar to HK in many respects. And here, uh, you know, 4% stimulus on a good field, you know, very bad, uh, very good performance of the, you know, detection. And then uh, I didn't see response is very high for 99% stimulus, almost never she reported I saw something over there. Okay, so uh, a little bit further, uh, you know, recently all these things are again are replicated by many other uh, uh, people group, at least uh, uh, Mr. Yoshida in Japan has done a several uh, ex uh, extensive study in the detail. And here he shows the lesion of the, um, uh, V1, mapping out exactly where the lesion was supposed to be uh, using a uh, more, you know, uh, modern technique of, uh, you know, MRI and CT and the visual per, uh, uh, perimetry, following up their uh, co study after 20 years. 
and basically they found a similar thing. And then further, uh, uh, Yoshida extended the finding all, uh, and also more quantified it into this visually guided saccade paradigm. So here, uh, the monkey was presented with a bright spot of the stimulus, uh, but the, the spot of the stimulus itself changed the luminance. And in the case of the normal uh, field, uh, the contralateral to the you know uh, the normal field, uh, the location of this you know saccade is plotted as a you know dot in each trial, and as you can see, you know each of the dot corresponds to one trial. So it's a thousands of thousands of trials they are really, really accurate. Um, it's a five alternative eccentricity times, you know, five different uh, angles. So 25, you know, options, and they are almost always accurate. On the affected side, each of the color corresponds to this, you know, uh, target location. And you can see that, you know, um, when the monkey was presented with this, you know, invisible stimulus, but uh, asked to make a saccade to that location, it's actually quite accurate. Here, you know, this uh, is already quali qualitatively very, very accurate. And this is a histogram showing the uh, target location to be always around here, 60, 30, 0, or 30, or 60. And then this normal field, uh, super threshold, or normal field, or near threshold, it's very accurate. And affected side, you know, there it's blurry, meaning that it's less accurate, but the peak locate, uh, locates almost the same as the target location of the stimulus. So that means that the, uh, even affected uh, uh, saccade is very, in a sense, you know, accurate. And then compared to the near threshold case, where in some case, monkey just don't see it, you know, and then, you know, there is some kind of dispersion here. You know, you can imagine that if you are shown something and you don't see it, then you can't even make a saccade. But in the case of the affected uh, uh, side on the bright uh, side monkey, presumably they don't see it consciously, but um, the um, eye movement is quite accurate and they don't behave like a near threshold version. So in summary, uh, this, uh, this part of the uh, 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 lecture, I showed uh, uh, evidence that blind side behaviors are mirrored and evidenced in a V1 lesion monkeys as well, and it's replicated recently. The nature of the deficits are uh, reliably replicated. And the spared behaviors are not only the localization by a touch, as you know, um, demonstrated in the blind side patients, but also saccharic eye movements. And uh, we are going to talk about these eye movements uh, in next week. And this is in, uh, this has an important implication about consciousness. So uh, uh, taken together with uh, Stan de Haines finding in the last part of the lecture, initial neural activity is not sufficient for consciousness because you know it can be activated by the you know uh, shown demonstrated by the EEG evidence, but um, it's it may be sufficient to trigger and. Uh, 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 guide the behavior by the arm and the eye movements. And that may be the one that is uh, leading to a uh, blind side behavior. So they can move around and also uh, walk because the initial visual uh, response is intact. And then uh, these arms and the eye movements are using this transient uh, response. That's the potential explanation of the blind side. And we will go into the detail in the next week about this hypothesis. And uh, uh, next video, uh, we are going to go to uh, how to characterize non-conscious behavior.